I'm a little verklempt. I need to recover for just a second here. That was great uh, time of worship together with you all. Uh, it's good to be with you folks who are here together in the worship space. Good to be with you folks who are worshiping in other places around the area and around the country. Uh, we are thrilled to be together to worship God this morning. So when you're worried about something, what's the least helpful thing somebody can say to you? <laughs> Don't worry, right? Like, oh, I, it never occurred to me. Thank you for that. It's gone. I'm no longer worried. It, it, you know, when somebody says that, <clears throat> they don't know what to say, typically, and um, it feels like they're just kind of dismissing uh, your concerns and the things that you are, are worried about. So, this morning, we're going to uh, go back into the upper room through the Gospel of John, and it's going to sound a little like Jesus is saying, hey, don't worry, in a dismissive kind of way. That's not what's happening. Just to kind of bring everybody up to speed, if you were here last week or if you missed last week, we are in the Gospel of John. We are looking at the upper room story, and John wanted us to know what happened in the room that night. And it was so significant. And thankfully, the Holy Spirit had John write it down. It was so significant to him that 25% of his gospel, he committed to what happened in the upper room at that last supper that Jesus shared with his disciples before his arrest and and execution. So last week, as we introduced this, uh, this part of the, the gospel, um, we looked at John chapter 13, the beginning of John chapter 13, and it's the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Now, as that chapter goes on, there's two really disturbing things that that. Jesus shares with his disciples. Two things that are very troubling. One is that one of them is going to betray him. And the other is that one of them is going to deny him. Not once, not twice, but three times. In effect, Jesus is saying, guys, very soon, all hell is about to break loose. Literally. Literally. That all that's going to happen is an unleashing of the forces of evil in the world and the spiritual realm. And all kinds of bad things are going to be conspiring against him and against them. That's how chapter 13 ends. Chapter 14 begins with Jesus saying, don't worry. Right? Actually, what he says is, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. All right but you just said some really troubling things. Some things that, I don't know, I feel like I want to worry about. And Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. This word troubled that, that's translated into English, troubled, from the Greek, the word literally means uh, to strike one's spirit with fear or dread. To strike one's spirit with fear or dread. That's the nature of worry, right? The definition of worry, or a definition of worry, is to give way to, anx to anxiety or unease. To allow one's mind 
to dwell on difficulty or trouble. So Jesus doesn't say, you know, just, hey, don't worry. Jesus gives his followers an alternative to allowing their minds and their spirits to go to that dark place and to live there and to dwell there, right? So he's giving them a different way to think. When evil and chaos are swirling around, he's not saying ignore it or deny it. Instead, he's saying choose to put your focus somewhere else, somewhere more productive, somewhere far better. And then Jesus goes on and talks about the kingdom of God. Friends, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, in my Father's house are many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's what Jesus tells them. Here's the bad news. Here's what I want you to focus on. Trust me. I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house are many rooms. And I'm going to prepare one for you. Two things about that that strike me when I read those words of Jesus at the beginning of John chapter 14. The first is that when you think about the absolute worst case scenario, it's death, right? Worst case scenario, you die. And Jesus is saying to them, trust me, that's not the end. The grave is not the end. End of this physical life on this planet is not the end of you. Really important for us to know that and to hear that. He wants his followers to know that there is life beyond the grave. And that's a promise that he makes to us. It's not wishful thinking. It's not giving us some false expectation so we're not as afraid of death. It's a promise. And the second thing is that this place where he's going is going to be familiar and comfortable. When Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms, he wasn't literally talking about a house, right? I don't think. I don't know any scholars who look at this passage and say that heaven is literally a house, right? I'm picturing this old bed and breakfast, right? <laughs> kind of thing, and, you know, you get your room, and down the hall is the bathroom, and it's not that, right? What I think Jesus is wanting us to know is that this place called heaven is going to be as familiar as a house, as comfortable as your room. At another time in, in Jesus' ministry, his earthly ministry, he was asked directly, what, tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. And what it becomes clear is it defies human description. He can't describe it in detail because it defies our ability to fully comprehend. So instead, he gives a little parable and he says it's like a guy who is walking through a field and he comes across this incredible pearl, this amazing, exquisite, one-of-a-kind pearl. And he is so excited by it that he runs off, he sells everything that he has in order to be able to purchase this field so he can possess this pearl. If you understood even a portion of what the kingdom of heaven was like, Jesus is saying, you would gladly give up everything that you have to possess it. 
So the kingdom of God is a familiar place, a comfortable place, and a place so exquisite that you would gladly give up anything in order to possess it. Jesus shares all of that, and the responses of his followers are both disappointing and oddly comfortable. Or not comfortable, <laughs> oddly uh, comforting. The responses are disappointing and oddly comforting. There are two immediate responses when Jesus tells them all this, right? He tells them how bad it's going to get, tells them don't let their hearts be troubled, trust him, trust God, he's going to be preparing a place. And their responses, there are two responses. First is, we have no idea where you're taking us or how to get there. And secondly, we don't know who you are. We don't know who you are. These are the guys who have spent three years of intensive teaching and being shown miracles that Jesus does. And now, as they face the ultimate challenge of their life, they forget, seemingly, everything. They forget what they've heard, and they forget what they've seen. So I want to take the time that we had this morning and look at these two responses in the face of the difficulties of life to what followers of Jesus said and, and what we can learn from them for our own lives. Thomas. Thomas, hearing about the kingdom of God, says, because uh, Jesus says to them, um, I'm going to prepare a place for you, right? And you know the way where I'm going. You know the way. And Thomas goes, no. Right? I have no, we have no idea where you're going, and we don't know the way. Really, Thomas? Really? You don't know where he's going? Did you just hear what he said? I'm going to prepare a place. He spent three years teaching them and having them go out and tell others about the kingdom of God. And now it's like, what? <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you mean. Three years confirming that there is life beyond the grave. And you don't know. But honestly, I am glad. I'm glad that Thomas asked the question, or made the statement, really. Because we get to hear the answer from Jesus. Jesus says to Thomas, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way. When Jesus says, I'm the way, his way is the way. His way, friends, is the way of the cross. Jesus came to earth for the purpose of giving his life as a ransom for many. To pay the debt for sin in the world. For your sin and my sin. Because we were told by God at the very beginning of creation that the cost of sin, the wage of sin, is death. Not just physical death, but a separation from the Creator, a holy God. And the only and the only way back is that someone must die. And so Jesus, the perfect one, comes to die for our sin. 
so that we might be made right with a holy God. Jesus came and died for you. His way is the way of the cross. And then by saying that he is the truth, what Jesus is affirming is that his words and his priorities and his values are correct. They're right. And they can be trusted. When we hear the words of Jesus, we can know that these are eternal truths. Not just for a time, not just for an era, not for just a, pers- a place in time, but forever. He is the truth. His way is true. And we can base our lives and build our lives as many of us have on the truth that Jesus taught. His way is the way, the way of the cross that he came and made a way for us to God. His words, his teaching, his actions are true and reflect who God is. And that way and that truth are life-giving. Jesus came to give us new life. So as we receive him, as we put our faith in him we have a new life no longer bound by the law where we're trying to earn our way to heaven we now live under grace forgiven and received into God's presence because of Christ's sacrifice it's a new way of thinking about ourselves it's a new way of understanding ourselves and our relationship to God and it's life-giving no longer carrying the heavy burdens of our failures and our faults our brokenness we have this new life and as we live into that new life we have God's spirit the Holy Spirit that takes up residence in our soul And as we live in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, as we are conforming to the direction of the Spirit, the Spirit is doing a transforming work within us, making us, in the way we talk about discipleship here, conforming us to the image of Christ, making us more like Jesus, living into his truth, not being sucked up into the life-depleting values and priorities of the world. And as we live like that, the Bible says that there is fruit being produced in us, spiritual fruit, the best things in life. So we have this new life in Christ, and through him and through the work of the Holy Spirit, we have an abundant life, the best that life has to offer. And it has nothing to do with the stuff of life that always promises and rarely delivers the things that we most long for and desire. And then ultimately we have this promise of eternal life. That we will live forever in God's house. In that place that he's preparing for you. I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. So, back to the room where it all happened. Thomas didn't know where Jesus wanted to take him or how to get there. That was his 
response, which is disappointing, right? I mean, how do you not know, Thomas? But Philip, Philip says, I don't know who you are, really, by his response is saying, I don't know who you are. Show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied, Philip says. And Jesus responds, seriously, dude? <laughs> That's the message version, I guess. Seriously? You don't know who I am? You don't know who I am. I've actually been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You're asking to see the Father? If you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. He went on and explained that I and the Father are one. Even if you don't believe, this is what Jesus says, even if you don't believe in my word, believe in what you have seen me do. This is so disappointing, right? I don't know how Jesus isn't losing his mind at this point. If you don't believe what my words are, at least know what you saw. You saw me walk on water. You saw me change water into wine. You saw me heal countless people. You saw me feed thousands with a kid's lunch. You saw me raise Lazarus from the dead. Have you forgotten all of that? You still don't get who I am? Still not quite sure. And what's a little terrifying is these are the people he's entrusting to take his gospel into the world to make disciples. This is what I find oddly comforting. I said they're disappointing, but they're also oddly comforting. Like Thomas, when life gets really hard, I can lose sight of where Jesus is taking me and what the way is. And I need to hear Jesus say, don't worry. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm preparing a place for you. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And like Philip, I can forget who Jesus is. And need to hear him say, when you see me, you see the Father. When I feel the most lost and, and wonder, where is God? Who is God? I need to hear Jesus say, when you see me, you are seeing the Father. When you read the accounts in the Gospels about what Jesus said and what Jesus did, you are seeing the heart of God. You're hearing the words of God. They're one. So maybe that's true for you. Maybe you're here today or online today and you've never invited Jesus to be the way for you to be the truth for you to be the life for you you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sins to take the gift that he gave us on the cross and make it your own and to receive his grace And like Thomas, you're wondering where it is that your life is going. 
and how you're going to get there. Or maybe this is a season of life for you where you're feeling like Philip. You're wondering who God is. Looking for the Father and not sure what you believe anymore or who you believe anymore. I find it comforting that two men in that room, and I'm sure they spoke for the others, were struggling in the midst of the hardships of life with these realities. And so I want to just give us some time this morning for prayer. To pray a, a Thomas kind of prayer for those who may have never invited Jesus to be the leader of your life, the forgiver of your sin, and to invite Jesus into your life to acknowledge that his way is the way to the Father, that his truth is eternal, and that he offers you a new life, an abundant life, and an eternal life. Or maybe for you it's going to be a Philip type of prayer, where the hardships of life, the challenges of life, the worries of life, have caused you to kind of lose sight of who God is. And you're wondering about God. Wondering where he is, wondering what he's, what he's doing, who he is. And need to be reminded that when you see Jesus, you are seeing God. So I'm going to start and I'm going to just kind of lead you through a Thomas prayer and through a Philip prayer and just give some time as well for you to uh, do your own business with God this morning. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your life as a ransom for our sin so that we might be right before a holy God. If you've never invited Jesus to be the leader of your life, to forgive your sin, I want to give you this opportunity now, to simply ask him to forgive your sin, to come into your life, to lead you in the way and in the truth and into life. Just talk to, talk to God right now. Talk to Jesus right now. There's no fancy words. There's no right way to do it, but to just invite him in. Let me just give you a few moments now. Lord, I just confirm those commitments that have been made to you and know that you are going to do a great work in the life of that man, that woman who invited you in today. Bless them. Show yourself to them in ways that confirm the commitment that they made this morning. For those of you who are struggling with your faith right now, you've walked in faith for years. But maybe you're going through a difficult time 
Or maybe it's just a dry time in your faith. And you're saying, Lord, show yourself to me, and we'll believe. Forgetting all of the ways that you've done that, all of the things that we've seen before, all of the truth that we've heard from you before that has given us life over the years, But Lord, now in this time of struggle or this dry time, this desert time in our faith, renew us. Lord, you have shown us the Father. We have seen your hand at work in our lives and in the lives of people around And so, Lord, we're grateful for Jesus. We're grateful for showing us the Father. And so, friend, if you are in that season right now, a season of, of just struggles in your life, spiritual dryness, give you just a few moments to do some business with the Lord. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would continue to speak into our lives. Encourage us when we feel discouraged. Help us not to focus our attention on the chaos and the brokenness of the world around us, in our own world, in our own lives, but to fix our eyes on Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. who shows us the way, who gives us the truth, and who fills us with a new life. And I pray, God, that we will, as we journey through the difficult times, trust you all along the way. And Lord, together, we affirm these things and offer you our praise and our thanks in Jesus' name. And God's people agreed and said, amen. amen. So if you made a commitment to Christ today, don't keep that a secret. Tell somebody that. Share, some, share that with somebody so that they can encourage you and, and walk alongside you. Talk to me. Talk to one of our pastors here. Talk to somebody uh, that you know that is uh, following Christ. Don't keep that a secret. And likewise, if you've been struggling with your faith, if you've been going through a challenging time or a dry time, and you just haven't really shared that with anybody, don't keep that a secret. We're all in this together. We're all in this together. And we need to encourage and support one another. And that's why we're here, right? That's why we gather. That's why we're the church, is for the, those seasons in life that we can be there for each other. So friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you this day and always. Amen. Have a great day. Don't forget to get a pretzel.